couple months ago, I was lucky enough to be invited to give a talk at Science Exclamation Point at a sort of like nightclub performance space nerd bar here in New York called Caveat. It's in Manhattan. The point of Science Exclamation Point is that they have two people give short science talks, and then each of those talks are followed uh, by some improv comedy that's done by a troupe called Thank You Robot, and the comedy is inspired by those talks. One of those talks is always by Ben Lilly, who is Caveat's founder and all-around great guy, and the other is a guest, and that was me back in April. Sadly, there is no document of that show, so the improv portion is lost to the ether. So I think you're just going to have to take my word for it that it was really good, that uh, they did a great job, it was very funny. But since the talk that I gave was relatively short, um, scripted with images and all that stuff, I thought it might be fun to make a short video of it, uh, edited really lightly for context and clarity. So that is what follows. I hope you enjoy it and please check out Caveat, check out Science Exclamation Point, which does a show every few months and does on occasion uh, stream performances live. So I'll put some links down uh, below wherever you are and uh, you can go check those things out. But uh, for the time being, on with the talk. Friends, hello, my name is Mike Rignetta and this was my first Instagram post. This is a photo of our late beloved dog, Jack. I posted this on April 3rd, 2012, and we are just gonna sail right past with zero self-introspection, the fact that I have been using Instagram for a decade. Also, to soften the blow of beginning what is ostensibly a science comedy talk, or a uh, video as the case may be, with a photo of a deceased pet, here is a photo of our current dog Jules, who is a huge lovable idiot currently in the other room growling defensively every time she chews on her own tail just slightly too hard. Anyways, this talk isn't about dogs or even photos. It's about social media, what we do with it, what platforms want us to do with it, and what they want us to think they want, which isn't really what they want. To start, we're gonna take a look at Instagram.com on the day that I posted that photo in 2012. So, first things first. Graphic design in 2012. Mm, brown rectangle. So, what does Instagram say Instagram is for? One thing you might notice is the overrepresentation of a single word, share. What are we doing with Instagram? We're sharing photos. We're putting them somewhere and maybe our friends and family who follow us will get to see them. And I guess, yeah, that's sharing. We're also moving photos between platforms. That's a type of sharing too, though maybe in a slightly more technical sense. Let's go see what Facebook looked like at this time. And for context, this would have been the month that Facebook announced it was going to purchase Instagram. Facebook is for connecting and sharing with the people in your life. Later this same year, the front page is more ponderous. We honor the everyday things that bring us together and celebrate people everywhere opening up and connecting. Share. Really love that this is an imperative. Share. Share what? Who cares? Just do it. Anyway, you go all around the internet at this time to various social media platforms, and this is what you see. Insistences that you can and should share things. Sometimes specific things, but often more vague commands to just share. With this altruistic tone, sharing is good, it connects us, and sharing is what social media is for, so social media is good. This is something Nicholas A. John at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem studied in 2012. He published a paper in New Media and Society called Sharing and Web 2.0, The Emergence of a Keyword. John looked at Instagram, Facebook, LiveJournal, YouTube, Flickr, Bebo, Photolog, Microsoft Live, and a few other social platforms that have since been flushed completely down the memory hole, and found that nearly all of them were explicit about and insistent upon this idea of sharing, which John characterizes as, quote, remarkably broad, far broader than any of the other words that might be found on social networking sites' self-descriptions. For sites that want you to distribute photos, and communicate your emotions, the notion of sharing covers all bases." End quote. This was seen as an unalloyed positive. Sharing, John writes, smacks of equality, selflessness, and giving, in combination with its resonance with what is viewed as the proper mode of communication between intimates. End quote. In January of 2012, Mark Zuckerberg, oh, no, sorry, I mean Mark Zuckerberg, oh, no, this is embarrassing, I mean Mark Zuckerberg, oh, there we go, 
Mark was even dogmatic about the importance and altruism of sharing, talking in Facebook's IPO filing about how sharing is both core to Facebook's ethos and would basically save the world. Quoting Zuck, John writes, Facebook was not originally created to be a company. It was built to accomplish a social mission, to make the world more open and connected. Facebook's objective is to strengthen how people relate to each other. Relationships, continues Zuckerberg, are how we discover new ideas, understand our world, and ultimately derive long-term happiness. Moreover, people sharing more, even if it's just with their close friends or family, creates a more open culture and leads to a better understanding of the lives and perspectives of others. This all fits within a kind of sharing ideology that pervaded this period of media technology history and is still endemic to a lot of contemporary discourse. It's this not so vaguely libertarian idea that the more is put out into the world, the more we can learn and see and experience, and so then the more we can accurately decide for ourselves what a good world looks like, given all of the available options. It's a kind of marketplace, I think you might call it. but. Not of goods, of, I don't know, ideas, perhaps? This ideology that sharing has de facto value and is even mandated by expectations of progress was so pervasive in the aughts that it was assigned as a personality trait slash character flaw to an entire generation of people. Thanks to an agenda set by the most ubiquitous media publishing and technology corporations of the time, sharing and really oversharing became a major hallmark of the millennial cohort, alongside an assumed yearning to go viral and, of course, the dispassionate destruction of various beloved industries. The one thing millennials don't share? Their dollars. With napkin companies. News at 11. The fact of the matter is, social media platforms wanted us to want to go viral, both inventing and incentivizing, largely through ad-supported means, said desire so that legions of us would blithely spend our days in the content mines feeding an insatiable desire, nay, need, to post and in the process develop almost the entirety of those platforms' value with no guaranteed return for our efforts. I mean, I fell for it. Probably a bunch of you did too. What can we say? We were young, dumb, and full of complacency. This, Nicholas A. John wagers, is what was probably behind the emphasis on sharing all along. Platforms could use feel-good, progressive-sounding buzzwords to hide the real deal that they were sharing whatever you shared and even a lot of things you didn't with parent companies, advertising partners, data brokers, media conglomerates, and so on and so forth. The major difference being when they share, they get paid and in real dollars, not imaginary internet popularity points. And what we now know, of course, is that while viral posts are hugely valuable to platforms, they're more like punishment for their authors, especially on YouTube and Twitter. Penance paid for the intersecting sins of hubris and posting, a mineral-rich vein that immediately caves in. We also now know that maybe there are some people whose ideas don't really need to be shared, and that putting everything out there all the time, with equal weight and no critical context, doesn't lead to the Disney movie forest of a future that Mark Zuckerberg imagined. Well, except for that one Disney movie forest. Hey, look, a puppy! So sharing isn't all it was cracked up to be, it turns out. You might wonder, do social platforms still tell you to do it? What are the various front pages of the internet telling us to do in 2022? Well, not only do they not talk about sharing, they don't talk about anything. What's Instagram for? Don't pretend like you don't know what Instagram is for, you loser. Facebook still sports the pithy, momentous declaration, but they have removed the word share. If you go all around the internet right now to various social media platforms, this is what you see, a total lack of insistences that you can and should share things. In fact, many sites are like this. They don't really attempt to explain themselves, they just are. Like the mountains and the fields, no one asks, and no one need be told what they are for. This is something Nicholas A. John at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem studied this year. He published a paper in New Media and Society called Sharing and Social Media, The Decline of a Keyword, in response to his original paper 10 years ago. John looked at Instagram, Facebook, LiveJournal, YouTube, Flickr, Tumblr, Snapchat, TikTok, Vine, 
and a bunch of other websites that your cousin with the Punisher sticker on his pickup truck uses, John found that social media sites don't really tell you to share anymore. He writes, quote, The demotion of sharing from the earlier status as the sine qua non of social media companies' self-presentation is unmistakable. It has been removed entirely from the home pages of many services or left uninspiringly in conjunction with objects such as pictures or videos, where its metaphorical work is minimal. In this chart, John charts the presence and absence of sharing across a decade of platform front pages and finds that while some of the older platforms may have once touted and then backed away from sharing, newer social sites never even bothered. Discord, Gab, Musical.ly, Parler, Secret, Telegram, and TikTok never once mentioned sharing, and many of the largest haven't since around 2013. John attributes this to the widespread understanding that sharing is not, in fact, a panacea, as Zuck once claimed, and is, in fact, a euphemism for actions with economic rewards not normally split with users. The first idea, then, he writes, is that the rhetorical power of sharing has waned over time as social networking sites' users have become savvier both as to their business model and as to their political impacts. No one, surely, thinks that social media are, in toto, a force for harmony, mutuality, and caring. It would appear, John later writes, that the decline of sharing reflects a distancing from utopian visions of the role of social media in making the world a better place, and the adoption of a more pragmatic attitude instead. So if this was sharing, at least nominally, what are my most recent posts? Showing off? Look at my hot wife. Look at this big smart book I read. Look at all these beautiful places I visited. I mean, this is in keeping at least with the received wisdom that Instagram is where you go not to share your life, but to actively construct a public version of it, one that's beautiful, aspirational, enviable. And if we no longer share on Twitter, what do we do there? Actually, you know what? I don't really want to talk about what being on Twitter is like right now. Nicholas A. John, for one, isn't 100% sure what happens post-sharing. We still do it, he says, but it's not labeled or lauded as it once was. He does point out to an early potential ascendant to the sharing throne, though, expressing oneself. In this, the age of occasional consequences for one's actions, a new crop of social media sites differentiate themselves by claiming that they can be used without fear of censorship, as if the public is otherwise somehow starved of the opinions of shitheads. But what of the rest of the internet? Here's what I see. Me and many of my friends waking up, turning over in bed, picking up a phone, and immediately ruining our day. Sometimes out of habit, sometimes out of a dedication to being well-informed, though I got bad news on that front. Turns out if you get most of your news from social media, you're probably less well-informed. Anyway, sharing. Sharing is, in several senses of the word, something that you're most willing and likely to do when you feel safe, confident, and comfortable. And every day we confront, often principally through social media, just how many of us do not feel safe, confident, and comfortable. It's a curse, maybe, but also an opportunity. You can choose, as many people do, to believe that there is something about contemporary society that has led to the invention of the problems that we confront every day, or you can realize that it is in large part through the technological affordances of contemporary society that many of us are able to finally witness so many struggles that were always already underway, but which remained remote for any number of reasons, like class, race, or region. There's hope in this, I think, as long as we realize something. And that's that knowing about things, just being informed, isn't enough. On top of knowing and having a critical orientation towards that knowledge, which is very important, we gotta act often in ways that are inconvenient, scary, dangerous, or some combination of all three. Nothing, and I mean this, and I really want you to hear it, nothing is going to change until it is changed. Nothing is going to get better until it is made better. So what are we doing now on social media if we're not sharing? I might say that in many senses, we are struggling with ourselves, yes, and each other, but also against oppressive governments, anti-worker corporations, and J.K. Rowling. We're struggling, but also struggling. It's just 
that doesn't look as fun when it's written on the front page of a website that you use to procrastinate at work by looking at like pictures of your nephews or other people's docs. That's all, folks. Hey, so uh, thanks for watching this. Uh, for those of you paying close attention, I do realize the convenience of posting this while I am taking a couple months off of Twitter, which I really do recommend. Um, just to sort of say a few things about this. Here's the thing. If you are very online and you think there's no way that you can like do your job or live in the world and not be on Twitter, for example, the fastest way to disabuse yourself of that notion is to take even three days off of social media or to change like one habit, like not looking at your phone right when you wake up or right before you go to bed. I'm serious. I'm not trying to get like preachy, you know what's best for you, you know the kind of spot that you're in, but I see a lot of people really unhappy with how much they look at the internet and say that they feel like they have to. And I'm here, uh, I'm here as a certified internet professional to tell you that you do not need to look at the internet as much as you do, especially if it's hurting you. You can stop, you can stop a little, you can stop a lot, and honestly, you're gonna be fine. And if not fine, you might even be better. So if you've been waiting for a reason to change some of your habits, maybe let this be that reason. That's it, that's all I'm gonna say on this. Though, while we're talking about this kind of thing, a couple people have also asked, uh, without comments on these videos, where are people supposed to talk about them, especially if they are not on Twitter? Uh, so first things first, one, nice, good for you. Uh, second, my answer is maybe insultingly simple. Just talk to your friends. Um, if you want, you can text them a link to one of these videos, ask them to watch it so that you can talk to them about it. But like even better, just pretend like they're your ideas. I give you permission, um, unless you're like writing a paper or something, in which case then you should be normal about it. But yes, please text a pal, say, do you ever notice how in action movies stuff gets on the camera lens all the time? What do you think the deal with that is? And then just go from there. Uh, not only do I not mind, I maybe kind of prefer it. So yeah, that's, that's my answer to that question that's come up a couple times. Okay, now that all that's taken care of, uh, here's the normal back matter. Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you to Ben at Caveat, and thank you, Robot, for the chance to perform at Science! Exclamation point. I'll put some links below if you want to check those things out. If you liked this video, you can help me make uh, more things like it by throwing me a couple bucks at patreon.com forward slash microgneta. Of course, thank you to all of my current patrons who get early, sometimes extremely early access to everything that I make. Uh, as far as things that are currently in the works, I have two longer videos uh, that are in progress. One is about Elden Ring and the other is about gross food videos online. Um, I'm hoping that the Elden Ring video will be out in a few months, maybe by the end of the year, uh, depending upon how much actual game footage I want to record. That is something that I am very slow and bad at. Uh, so um, if I can figure out a way to forget, if I can figure out a way to forego like, you know, recording my PS5, uh, that will make it come out sooner. But the nice thing about that is that it's like 90% written. Uh, so yeah, uh, good news on that front. Yeah, I think that's everything that I wanted to say. So I hope you're having a good day. I hope you're having a good month and season. Uh, I hope you're safe. I hope you're healthy. And I will see you soon. Okay. <laughs>